So in this video, we're going to talk about carrier drift. Uh, and this is just how electrons and holes uh, respond to externally applied electric fields. You may have heard of drift by its other name that it likes to go by, uh, Ohm's Law. Uh, and that is, uh, that is what we will get to by the, by the end of the video. So if we look at what's going on in silicon with electrons and holes at, uh, at room temperature, so we've got some, say, T equals 300 degrees Kelvin, we'll see that this electron, uh, or a hole if you prefer by this point, sort of just meandering around in the lattice. And since we've got a finite temperature, this electron uh, is moving pretty fast. It's, it's actually moving at around 10 to the seven uh, centimeters per second, or 10 to the five meters per second, uh, much faster than you and I uh, could ever move if we, if we wanted to. So the electron's moving very, very fast. But that's not to say that it's moving freely. Uh, it's got to contend with a bunch of stuff uh, sitting in the silicon lattice. So it's got to contend with a bunch of silicon atoms. Uh, and these silicon atoms at room temperature are actually moving back and forth. So these, el these electrons can collide with these moving silicon atoms, and that's referred to as scattering. And specifically, this kind of scattering is referred to as lattice scattering. So the electron's initially moving this way, and then it hits the silicon, and it starts moving in a completely different direction. But we also know that silicon atoms aren't the only thing in the lattice. We've also probably doped the lattice with a bunch of dopants. So if this is an N-type uh, semiconductor, then we probably doped it with a bunch of phosphorus or arsenic. And we know that this phosphorus is sitting here with a positive charge on it. Uh, not a hole, but a positive charge. So if the electron were instead moving in the direction of the phosphorus, so let's say it had a velocity in the direction of the phosphorus, then when it starts to get close to the phosphorus, uh, the electromagnetic force is going to start pulling it in closer and closer and closer and the electron's movement is gonna be disturbed. Uh, and so when it leaves the, the presence of the phosphorus, we also say that it's been scattered. And this is referred to as ion scattering. Uh, so there's two different physical mechanisms for electron scattering within the lattice, but it's the same basic idea each time. Initially, it came in with a certain velocity and it leaves with a different velocity. It's changed its direction and its absolute velocity. In reality, uh, the picture is a little more complicated because electrons are waves, so it's actually the waves scattering that is significant. But it's easier to think of, uh, or it's easier to think of in a more classical, uh, more classical perspective. So we want to know, uh, not forgetting the whole purpose, how the electron responds to an external electric field. Well, when we don't know how something applies to a force, we just we just start with Newton's law. That's that's just a, a great starting point, no matter where we are. Uh, so F equals M A. Or in this case, uh, let's let's talk about the force on a hole uh, instead of an electron because it's exactly the same. But I won't have to deal with this negative sign. So we've got Q times the electric field, which is the force on the hole, is just equal to the mass uh, or the effective mass of the hole. Uh, times the acceleration, or the acceleration is just equal to Q times E divided by the effective mass of the hole. Now, we're interested in not necessarily the acceleration, but we're interested in the velocity. Uh, and so we know that acceleration is just the time derivative of velocity. Uh, and if we're interested in the actual velocity, we just integrate both sides with respect to time. And we'll get that the velocity as a function of time is just QE divided by the effective mass of the hole times T, or delta T if you prefer, uh, time going from one point to another point. So this tells us the electrons or the hole's velocity, but this is a free space result. This is assuming that the electron doesn't encounter anything on its path. But we said that the electron or the hole um, doesn't doesn't matter, but let's let's do the hole. Uh, so we said that the hole 
was moving, 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 and then it hits something. So it hits maybe a, a negatively charged, a, a neg negatively charged acceptor like uh, boron. So let's say it, it hits it hits a negatively negatively charged boron. It has its velocity changed. So the time from between it, when it hits one boron to the time when it hits another boron. So the average time uh, we're going to refer to as tau, uh, or if you want tau i for the ion ion scattering. So the time between collisions is just tau i. So we can apply this result from Newton's law only between this time and this time, so only between the collisions. So we can say that this velocity uh, at the time that it hits the next boron, uh, or Vmax, is just equal to QE times tau i divided by the effective mass of the hole. And we know from calculus that, well, the average velocity is just one half of this, uh, but in reality, um, scattering is a statistical process. It doesn't happen with the same tau each time, so the one half will actually end up going away, and we'll get that v average is just qe times tau i divided by the effective mass of the whole. And this is an interesting result because it says that the velocity is proportional to the electric field. We can rewrite the average velocity is just q tau i over mp star times the electric field. So before it was the acceleration that was dependent on the electric field. But when you've got a lattice and you've got this scattering process that goes on constantly, the velocity is proportional to the electric field. And we call this constant of proportionality the mobility mu. And so we can just rewrite this equation as a V average is equal to mu e, or the velocity due to an electric field is just equal to this constant of proportionality mu called the mobility times the electric field. Uh, but you might say, hold on a minute, you've only accounted for one of the causes of scattering. You've only accounted for the ion scattering, uh, to which I would reply, uh, yes, astute viewer, you are correct. Um, so really, we need to account for both uh, ion scattering and lattice scattering. And the way that we do that is we can we need to go back to basic probability theory. So within some time dt, there's a certain probability that we'll get ion scattering, and there's, there's a certain probability that we'll get lattice scattering. And the probability of ion scattering is just equal to dt divided by tau i. This is for very small dt. So the probability is just proportional to the time divided by the average time between events. And for the probability of lattice, I'm just going to say P of L, that's just equal to dt divided by tau L. And so the, the probability of either one of them happening, uh, ion or uh, union L, is just equal to the probability of one happening, ion, plus the probability of the other happening, L, uh, minus the probability of both of them happening, ion intersection L. But the probability of both of them happening is so vanishingly small because this is a really unlikely event to start out with. It's dt over, over tau. It's in some very small time. So these are very small probabilities. So the total probability of scattering is just approximately equal to dt over tau 1 plus dt over tau 2. Or we can say that dt over tau effective, uh, so the effective time scattering constant, uh, is just equal to dt over tau i plus dt over tau 2. And since the mobility is just proportional to tau, uh, it's got a bunch of other dependencies, but it's proportional to tau, we can just write that 1 over mu effective, or 1 over mu total, is 1 over mu i plus 1 over mu l. And that's our total, uh, that's our total mobility. So that's how we account for the fact that there's multiple mechanisms at play.
And so this is really cool. Uh, we've now managed to encapsulate all of these complicated effects, uh, ion scattering, lattice scattering, everything, uh, the Newton's laws, into a single equation uh, that the velocity of a hole uh, is just equal to the mobility of the hole, or mu p, uh, times the electric field. It's an incredibly simple equation, and typically we'll calculate, we'll have a numerical value for this mobility. So mobility is typically something that you'll be given, um, or it's typically something that the fabrication facility uh, gives you. And the electric field is what you apply. Uh, so you can calculate the velocity of your charge carriers. And remember that this is assuming that the velocity is much smaller than the thermal velocity. And if this assumption fails, then you get what's called velocity saturation. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a future video. But this is really cool. Um, it's, it's a really simple way of figuring out uh, what the, how carriers respond to electric fields. It's about as simple as equations get. Uh, and then in the next video, I'm going to extend this to electrons, and I'm also going to derive an expression for the drift current and how this relates to Ohm's law and how it turns into Ohm's law. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and I'll see you next time.